time, so and uh, we are uh, we have eleven o'clock. So welcome uh, uh, again to our last session today, uh, the last session uh, of the um, strand on digital textual uh, scholarship. So it was a full week, and uh, we are almost there in the afternoon. There will be the closing keynote by Fabio Vitali on the neutral point of view as a harmful thing. So that's a very provocative uh, um, um, talk I, I'm expecting, but I think uh, this will be brilliant. Here. So uh, don't miss the afternoon lecture by Fabio Vitali from University of Bologna. Uh, today, so the, the last topic uh, for many of, uh, for, for traditional scholars and also for us the most important thing is how to present your edition so I mean you can uh, spend your lifetime uh, uh, doing research uh, enriching your data creating wonderful uh, data but in the end people want to see and want to use your material um, and that's uh, a very difficult task I have to say there are very few tools that will uh, fit or that there is never a tool that fits all your your needs um, this um, presentation will introduce to a very basic uh, concept of how to visualize uh, um, your um, data your XML data your textual data uh, so a very basic uh, concept uh, that will be introduced briefly by Paolo Monella and the, the whole session of half an hour will be conducted by the whole team of teachers from, from this strand. And uh, yeah, after that, we will have a discussion uh, and you can uh, also ask very specific question uh, um, if you need uh, more clear ideas or hints or references uh, for your specific projects and ideas. After that, there will be uh, the closed session, uh, uh, which has we, we entitled "How to Apply This on My Research or on My Project." We have been discussing yesterday afternoon. Since we are by now, uh, so a number of about forty persons who really uh, very uh, um, thoroughly followed uh, these open lectures, uh, we thought uh, we open up the last session for everyone who is interested and has. Uh, burning questions on, on their mind uh, and so um, we will see how this works with 40 persons but I think uh, we got all used to have a organized uh, structured discussion um, after uh, the, the presentation so we will have a short break and then uh, everyone is invited to um, take part in this round table discussion on uh, how to use all the, the wonderful things we got to know and learned during this week. Okay, then I hand over to uh, Paolo and uh, yeah, I put myself on mute. So uh, as always, everything is being recorded and will be uh, published on our YouTube channel as soon as we have the, the edits ready. So please be aware of this and questions as always in the chat, comments, references. So if uh, there is useful information, we always publish also the information in our uh, on our website uh, with the um, with the um, text that is in the thread. Thank you. Thank you, Franz. So welcome everybody. It's the last day. Uh, I'm pe I'm pasting in the chat of this. Uh, of this meeting, the um, the, the website of our of our school, and the page with materials, as well, because we all the materials that we're going to use today are in this at this link. In a minute, okay. This is the link with the materials that will be used today. We thought that we would uh, make this a very practical session, so to speak. So we'll give a very short introduction on transformation from XML to HTML for visualization. And then Alberto Campagnolo will show a practical example and will ask you to follow along with him of this kind of transformation. So um, if you go to the, uh, to the, um, to the URL of uh, our materials, our materials again, um, which is the last one that I just pasted, you can also find the slides. Okay, let's get this started. Uh, Full screen, share. You should see my screen in a minute. Can you see? Can you see that? You see yourself basically. 
and this is the presentation. Okay, here we go. Um, the presentation has been created by Daniele Fusi and Tiziana Mancinelli. In fact, it was longer than it is right now, but we thought, as I said, to make this more practical and hands-on than theoretical and to give you a practical example of what you do. Okay, now imagine I have my, uh, my XML, TI XML file, uh, which is declarative markup, meaning that I don't say that the header is bold. It should be visualized with bold. I say that a header is a header that the head of a chapter is a head of a chapter. I say that the foreign word is a foreign word. I don't say that it should be visualized in um, italics. I just say that it's a foreign word. But I, wh why do I do that? Mostly because I want uh, to, uh, to analyze my text, to have some software that processes it. Otherwise, what's the point of doing this in digital form, right? But in addition to analyzing, making indexes, making, making statistics, um, making automatic collation of different witnesses, etc., I also want to visualize this for the human. So the simplest way we do this is, tra is by transforming XML to HTML. One, you can do this in many ways. I personally use other, other programming or scripting languages such as Python in my last edition. And in the previous edition, I used the JavaScript. This is just to say that you can use many tools to transform XML to HTML. As we saw in the first on the first day, HTML is a language for representation. Uh, I'm sorry, for presentation. So let's say that XML is the language for uh, for representation. Okay. Um, let's open this all. Okay. Um, after I created my XML and I represented the text, meaning that uh, uh, I said that the foreign word is a foreign word, so we call this semantic markup because it refers to the semantics, to the meaning of the text, so to speak. Um, I want to create uh, a true transform XML in HTML for the presentation so that a browser can show this. Obviously, I can transform XML uh, into other formats that are also viewable. Uh, so, a specialized language that does this is XSLT. As I said, there are other languages. Many languages can do this. All programming languages, in, in, in theory, can do this, can transform a file into another file. But XSLT has been created for this. So, XSLT performs a transformation from XML to HTML. When I want to present the text, for, for instance, in a browser or in a web app or in an app on your, on your, on your cell phone, I, I need I normally use three um, connected languages HTML that we saw in the first days of this uh, summer camp uh, is the basis of it uh, CSS takes care of the appearance so CSS is the part is the language that should get, take care of saying for example that foreign words should be in italics or should be in color gray or should be underlined whatever you want J, JS or JavaScript should take care of the behavior that is of transforming my web page in HTML into something but dynamic, such as I click on something and I get some results, for example, or input text or other things. So HTML is the static part with the basic information. CSS take care of the formatting, pretty much. JS is a programming language that makes my, my page work and do stuff, such as when I go to the train, for example, for, to, to the railway website, I insert the city from which I want to start and the city to which I want to arrive, and I get some results. Much of this is done on the, on, on the client side by JavaScript. So, XSLT, what's this XSLT? It's a programming language very much, but it's written in, H, in, I'm sorry, in, X, in XML. So, if you see an, X, an XSLT file, it looks like an XML file because it is an XML file. It's a special XML file that transforms XML into another, into another format. Um, it's a declarative transformation language. It's input, so that what you give to XSLT as an input is... Uh, yeah, sorry, I, I meant odds with this presentation because it has so many beautiful... Okay. Uh, transitions that we don't use. So the input is XML. The output can, can be many things. I can transform XML with XSLT with, into another XML file with different features, into HTML, into SVG, and in other formats. Oh, by the way, this is important, an important thing to say. Imagine I have a digital scholarly edition written in TI XML, and I want to publish it in print, for example. I want to provide a, a, an output format, a visualization format that's not 
HTML. HTML is meant for a web page. Can I do that? Yes, I can. I can export into LaTeX, into into PDF, for example, for print. And if I am masochist, I can also it can even in, uh, export in Microsoft Word. I don't really recommend that. Um, okay, so how does uh, XSLT work? Um, it works in a, in a similar way than uh, CSS for HTML. So um, we, you have seen some CSS in the first days of this summer camp. What does CSS do? CSS matches a set of nodes via CSS selectors. For example, C, the CSS style sheet, that's the one that gives the formatting of a web page, uh, has an instruction that says anytime that you see uh, H1, the HTML, um, the HTML um, element H1, which means a header, um, use font um, sans serif, use uh, uh, font style bold, for example, right? So the first thing that CSS does is matching a specific element, a set of elements, every time that, that uh, there is an H1, this is the matching part, and then apply a specific rule. For example, each time that you match an H1, use the bold. Uh, character, the bold font. XSLT works pretty much the same, but for XML, it matches a set of nodes via another specification, which is XPath, and transform it using an XML-based template. And then serialize means export, output, another file. Okay, let's. I will conclude this short presentation uh, by showing you a little bit what an XSLT file looks like. Um, however, we won't get into any detail, detail because we have 30 minutes altogether, and we also want to show you how to practically do this with your edition. So, TEI XML to HTML. This, imagine this is the structure of a TEI document. It's XML, so it has a hierarchical structure. It's a tree. There's this text element that's on top, well, on top of the textual part. It has one child, which is body, which has many ch children with, like div and others. What XSLT does, it, it ignores TI header and faximile. Why? Because TI header provides metadata, uh, so you don't visualize it. And the faximile provides linking to images, so um, XSLT normally ignores them. Body contains many divs, and each div may contain a number of other elements, such as head, paragraph, columns, etc. Um, so this is the skeleton of an XSLT file. What you see in the in the pink in the pink box is a, an example of XSLT. This is what XSLT looks like. As you can see, it really looks like like HTML. I'm sorry, like XML. In fact, it is XML. So. Um, this part simply matches the root element, the root element of the XML document. I won't get into this in detail. I will show you an, a template, which is kind of easier to grasp, which is this. You define a number of templates, which are rules, pretty much. Rules that ask SSLT to match, to find a specific element in, a, in, a, in, a, in the XML input document. Okay, for example, in this example of XSLT code, you see here, you have TI, colon num. Num, N-U-M, is, is short for numeral. Num is the name of a, of a TI XML element that we use for numerals. So if I have a numeral, like in my edition I had a Roman numeral such as XB, which is Roman num numeral for 15, I wrap it, mark it up with num. So I have num, XB, close num. So this rule, this template, in XSLT basically means the following. Find all TEI elements, num, right? In fact, the instruction is match. This is an XSL template, a rule, that matches, match, TEI element, num. So what it says, and here you have the XML closing tag that says all this is a template that matches num. So this instruction as the software that will use this XML file as a guide, uh, as this XSLT file as guidance, the software will match all numerals. What shall it do? It will transform all numeral elements into something else. What's this something else? What you can see over here, span. So the input document XML has num. 
the output document will match the, out, the output document will be HTML and will produce a span element. So in the same point of the text in which in XML you had a num, in the HTML output document you will have a span element. So it will transform num into span. Not only that, XSLT it tells the software that in that point of the text you want a span with attribute class with value and R. So basically, whatever was num15 becomes span class nr15. Then this attribute nr will be used by CSS. The CSS is the language that gives you the formatting of the HTML. So we can use CSS to say whenever a span HTML element has class nr, please do it, please show it in red, for example. What's the content of span? Apply it in place. The content of span in the output HTML is whatever is output by all the matching templates. So the same content of num is transposed into the content of the HTML element span. And that's pretty much it for my presentation. I kept it short on purpose. I shall hope it wasn't too short or too unclear. So I'm looking forward for your questions. Everyone seems surprised that this is uh, already over. So, uh, no, but please ask, ask uh, simple questions. So, this is new to you, and uh, you are supposed to have understood, or, or, or you not have understood, but you, you should get an understanding when we finish this session today. So, please ask if you have uh, any doubt or uncertainties here. I have a question. Please. Um, it's pretty basic. I have to say I'm not that familiar with XSLT, but um, my understanding is that uh, TI is a, like a subset of XML, so you've got like um, a vocabulary, a limited vocabulary. So uh, when you transform um, TI XML into HTML, for example, which is quite an open, wide kind of vocabulary, uh, less less confined than TI, for example. Ha I mean, is the XSLT, does the XSLT then have to be confined with a schema to match, to always um, uniquely match? Or how does that work? Uh, does, is that clear? Or <laughs> yeah. I guess so. I don't know if Tiziana was your answer. Uh, the no, short uh, answer is yes, <laughs> but yes, go ahead. No, 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 no. I mean, is um, just saying the um, TI is the a vocabulary of XML, which is not a subset, and this is a it is a proper vocabulary, and every vocabulary uh, have a namespace. The namespace define that particular vocabulary. And the namespace will be used in uh, um, every XSLT in order to, um, to tell the, the, the language, okay, I want to transform the P that I use in TI into um, another HTML tag. And that's, that's that the P that is actually the same P that we use in HTML is that we have P with, with the angle brackets, we have the P in HTML, and we have the P in TI, but it's not the same P. One is TI dot um, P, which is TI is the namespace that we refer to the vocabulary of TI, and that P is just the HTML P which is obviously in both cases is paragraph but they they come from two different vocabularies thank you yeah well, another interesting thing to say is that in principle xslt only transforms xml to xml so in other words the output is uh, 
X HTML, which is an HTML which is compliant with XML rules. Well, there are so many other things we could have expanded upon, but we really wanted to give you now a practical understanding of this by doing the thing. Anyway, yeah, welcome. Questions are most welcome because I kept it short, so I could focus on what is not clear to you. I wrote something on the chat, yeah. by the way. Yeah, I, I just want to say that the, um, as we can see, the, the, the way how we um, encode or we create models for our text and our in interpretation can be different. TI, XML, we, we can uh, introduce load, we can introduce uh, VSQL, we can uh, have different kind of data. And then presentation is a, another different phase, or I mean, is another stage of this uh, of the realization of our uh, of our digital edition, and this is something that is also um, it, it, it's the way we want to present our data, and we have to take care of two different things. One thing is. Uh, uh, we get really excited uh, of encoding sometimes because obviously we we have of oh, we we have these aspects that we want to encode that this other feature and everything is really important for our for our research or for for our scholarly research and but that oh, for our aim in a goal of our, for for a digital scholarly edition, but we uh, we have to uh, always bear in mind that sometimes there are tags that are begging to be retrieved, because we we never get you know that there is a not this this other the workflow that will uh, that will uh, transform all our data in uh, the presentation and so to be used to someone else that is uh, another different different um work and this is something that we have to uh, we have to think because uh, because encoding and i'm just referring to ti encoding is very time consuming this is one of the, the the main thing and we don't want to spend lots of time to encode and then you know like give uh, only half of our of our work um and the other on the other hand we we um we also need to think that um the presentation can be just uh one uh just it can refer only for for just one level of, of uh what we are doing uh, of what we want to present and we can we can always uh, think okay i'm gonna present just these these things, this part of the uh, of my research, and then in two years, I'll try to introduce other other um, formal representations of, of my data. So we can also think, okay, I encode uh, five features of, of my editions, uh, of my edition, and then um, I will present um, next year first the first phase and then in two years time i'm gonna um, i'm gonna do the, the 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 other the other part the but this is something that we always have to um we need to plan everything uh, it has to be planned i i think the way we can really uh, we every and and everything has to have a model and an interpretation so we need to understand what okay what are we going to deliver why are we going to deliver this more questions otherwise uh, the great moment has come uh, upon you that uh, we or uh, alberto um, campagnolo would show you now how to create a presentation from your beautiful data that you have created uh, during the week and if you uh, failed or uh, lost track you can uh, uh, use also the um, xml file that we provided uh, on Tuesday afternoon, I think it's also in the same same folder. But Alberto will give you uh, instructions how to to do this, so that you have an actual use case. And uh, yeah, let's see. Yeah, and also yeah. as we go through this, we won't it only take a minute to do it. And those who did yesterday my VSCOL, uh presentation, the the private one, 
uh, have done this already. So it's just a matter of applying the transformation scenario. So as you as we go through, if you have questions, just you know shut shut them out. Uh, so the first thing is that uh, you need to have downloaded the material uh, that uh, Paolo provided earlier, so that you should have. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Okay. So now you should see my uh, screen uh, with the oxygen uh, software. So if you download the files, you should have uh, something like this in your uh, your computer. And if you open up uh, what the okay, let me just see. I lost you. Here it is. Uh, what was the name of the uh, project? Uh, let me see. So yeah, if you open up the transform XPR file by your download, you basically op open up the project in Oxygen. Basically, everything is set up for you to have everything as I see it on my computer. So I lost you again. I hate this. Where are you? Yeah. I can see you. I hate this presentation. I can't see you as I, as I present my stuff. So um, give me some feedback that you have your files. So there are some people who have problems that uh, download it from the GitHub. So you can download uh, uh, from the um, Google Drive, right, Paolo? Or is that uh, limited access? I, I I just put no no I just put everything in the in the chat. Okay. Um, it's now on GitHub, so it's open access. Okay. Oh, but they have problem to to download yeah. it from GitHub. So if uh, we have uh, it also the, from the one, the one. Yeah. Or I can zip them and upload them as a zip file if you prefer right now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, let's take okay, the time. So that's, I think that's fine. We should do yeah, that. Yeah. Just a minute, just a minute. And while Paolo does that, I can show you the SSLT that we are going to apply. So this is the SSLT uh, that is taking the information from the TEI file that we put together. And uh, as you can see here on, uh, uh, on the left hand side, uh, you have all the different templates that this, uh, this SSLT is, uh, is um, analyzing. And for each one of these, you have, you know, wh whenever you find the uh, TI body, then do this. Whenever you find the TI date, do this. So it's basically just the SSLT will go through your TI, so your TI, uh, XML file of origin that you want to transform, and it goes down from the root down to all the elements. And every time it finds something for which it has a template, it will do whatever you say in the template. This is basically how it works uh, technically. And okay, now, now it's done. It's a zip file. Go there, right click, download. Uh, right, you go to you go there and you do download or save as and save it on your computer. And then unzip it. Don't just open it as zip. So once you unzip it, you will have. Okay. Thank you. So Okay. 
Yeah, so you just press on uh, download, it gets down to your computer. I'm gonna slack it all. And I have my files here. Once you have your unzipped folder, if you open up this transform XPR file, which is basically just a, an oxygen uh, project file, which has on top of all the files that you see here already in, in the structure, in the folder structure, it has also all the other information that links this file for you to be able to apply transformation without having to, uh, to do uh, anything more than just say which one of the transformation scenario you want to apply. So it's all free box for you to be able to do it very quickly. So if I open up this, it opened up my uh, oxygen file, oxygen uh, project. And it's gonna open it again now. Of course, doing this in presentation mode, it means it's gonna be very slow now. Okay. So let me open up the XSLT again and the TI file again. Very slowly. Okay, so I'm gonna do it now and then uh, I'll go back if people uh, are behind a little bit. So I'm gonna show it as it is now. So, uh, you open up your XML file, you go to document, transformations, uh, configure transformation scenario so you can see every, everything that you can do to this file. It shows you stuff that is preset for you. Uh, and the one that we want to use is this project uh, transformation scenario, which is a transform, which is the one that comes with the tick. You apply it. And it's doing it. There you are. That's the HTML file uh, done. And uh, it's you already had it in your list here, but actually it's been re rewritten on top of what you had before. And then I can open this with a system application. And that's your HTML file with all the things that we wanted to show and add. And this was created by your uh, XML file. So let me go back to uh, scene first here. If the participants want to use their own file, they have to replace it in the folder, right? Yes. But yeah, they can just uh, apply the transformation scenario to their own file. Yeah. Yeah. Paolo, you are you talking? I think he's doing tutoring in the okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. separate room. Yeah. Um, so uh, did so where did we lose people? Let's go that way. <laughs> did you have the file? And were you able to open up the Oxygen project? The XPR file. Good. So once you have that, it's all set up for you. So uh, open up your XML file, which is a TEI XML. And you go to Document, transformation and configure transformation scenario. I'm gonna leave the screen like this for a while. I mean, you can also do straight away apply transformation scenarios because it's already set up for you, but I, I, I want to show you whatever, what else you can do. So there is where you can uh, up, 
add more transformations, uh, add more, more scenarios and add more things. So in a configured transformation scenario is where you see all the transformation scenarios that are available to you uh, on this project. So document transformation, configure transformation scenario gives you the list. And then you just go to apply the one that you want, which is we want to transform XSLT, apply. And uh, now it's lower than usual because I'm presenting, uh, but it's doing the transformation. There is a warning uh, message that's actually set up inside the XSLT to tell me, oh, there's something here that you should look into. And uh, this is the HTML file. And it's just been rewritten on top of the one that we had before. OK, so. Did it work for you? I see some nodding, so. I'm hoping that's a good thing. Peace. <laughs> Happy. So this is how you apply the uh, XSLT within uh, uh, Oxygen. So it's pretty straightforward once you have all set up. Doing the setup is a bit more uh, complex, but uh it's just a matter of telling so the software that you want these xslt to be applied to to a certain uh, uh xml document and or you can also say i want this to be written into an external file but all of this it's it's just setting up it's uh, the programming is done on the xslt really yeah um just just saying that um, the XSLT, I mean, you can, uh, you can think uh, of different kind of presentations. If we want to add another um, tag in our TI, in our XML, uh, it won't be a retrieve like that. I mean, we need to create another template in order to transform in something that obviously we need to decide what is. So everything can be different. It's not only, that's why the, the, um, we didn't want also to introduce, or we, we can obviously introduce some, um, or mention uh, some software that, for visualization, because, because our um, edition can be different from the visualization that certain uh, uh, software can, uh, can use or it can be different because uh, we want uh, deliver that uh, we want to we want present our data in, in different ways and uh, that's that's something that we, we, we always have to think about uh, is it the way how I want to present my data yeah yeah, you would create a scenario for anything you need. So you, for, for your register, so, so your index of names and persons, how to connect them then uh, via hyperlinks to Wikipedia. All this is being uh, um, organized via XSLT transformation. So you create lots of lots of lots of pages, usually uh, by applying various scenarios. And then you build together your your additionals, all the components you, you want to have. You organize them chapter by chapter, create an another page. So all, all these things are organized via these transformation scenarios. And you ha will have, uh, so if it's a huge problem, also if it's a small one, you have uh, 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 a long list of, of scenarios to create all the uh, pretty and useful things uh, you, you need for the uh, presentation of your edition as a whole. Okay, I, I noticed there are uh, already uh, general and specific questions in the chat, which we lost as we go. So please, um, I think if if we close the um, visualization part uh, now, and do we want to 
immediately start with a discussion um, or do we need a short break? Uh, okay, then I would open uh, the discussion. So half an hour or so we have now to so think a little bit what you now is your chance to ask one short question each or no no i mean we will see as it goes along but please be short we should be short also in answering questions so because it's easy to elaborate on one question uh, 15 minutes and then the whole time is eaten up so we uh, we try to be short uh, if you manage to post your question in the chat then we just go um, one by one um, as you uh, posted your questions and maybe you elaborate on your questions if there if it's not uh, clearly understandable or the point um franz may i uh, yes. we also we, we had scheduled this i know you have helicopters and you can't hear me but we had scheduled in the program also the idea of uh, attendance sharing how they would apply their this knowledge to their project in addition to, pro to questions right yeah, so the, the questions uh, can address all, all parts of the, of the strands so far, from the beginning, from uh, HTML, XML markup questions, uh, to TI questions, to, um, to questions on materiality and linked open data, uh, and the semantic web to the presentation. So uh, you are now free to uh, ask whatever you think is now important for you to understand or make sure uh, in order that you can start to embark on your personal project or to look for information that is uh, essential for you to proceed. So here comes the first question. Uh, Sara Ayres, is it possible to have uh, two IIIF images from different sources on the same page to facilitate comparison? So well, that's a question for our image uh, professionalists, uh, Tiziana, Paolo, what do you say? Well, my, the short question is yes, because if you mean on the same page, you mean the presentation, right? So eventually you basically have a website which is built with HTML and then CSS and JavaScript. And that HTML may include as, as, as many things as you want, right? So you can encode as long as you encode that information in the XML XML so the XML has the information and the information is this page is connected to this and this in triple IF image whatever image right? so the XML has the information and your software your transformation software that transforms XML to HTML has has been built in such a way as to present it in HTML in a in a in an easy way you can do pretty much what you want that's my short answer. So anybody else, please, please. Uh, but yeah, but no, short, short is fine. Mirador. Short is fine. Yeah, I just pasted the uh, demo for the project Mirador, which is one of the viewers for IIIF, and there you can you can add your own uh, links uh, for to images or for manuscripts or whatever you want, and you can add as many uh, tiles as you want. So you can compare for you know one uh, manuscript from the Vatican Library to one uh, whatever you want, and it's all fine. So More questions? Yeah, yeah. Please don't be shy. This is uh, your opportunity <laughs> here. And don't uh, be embarrassed for stupid questions. There are no stupid questions. I, we all know that this was a very heavy load of contents, new, new content, and uh, absolutely natural that you can't take this all up in one go. Um, I have a question. <laughs> I'd be interested personally in in uh, using the TI, like a TI markup document, um, and transform it into linked open data. Could, do you have some uh, good suggestions on where to look, like very targeted? I mean, I work particularly on manuscript uh, descriptions, but anything.
who has a good suggestion here? So I mean, you're uh, fine already with TI, so that's already uh, a most basic important step. So XML, and then you have all the possible transformation scenarios. But where where to go then, Tiziana? You want to say something? No, I mean, in terms of the manuscript description, um, I'm actually um, uh, is actually a, a, an open question at the moment because uh, uh, an open issue um, because that there are different ways to describe manuscript in uh, in uh, link open data. I mean, link open data in a semantic web. Um, and there's a that the the Biblissima project has a, um, a, a model for describing manuscript. I'm actually um, now um, I got uh, two articles um, for reviewing and ontologies uh, uh, for the description of manuscripts. So there is uh, there is a, um, a need. Uh, there is also another uh, uh, some other projects, but they are all related to catalogs. So catalogs of manuscripts, or catalogs of migrating manuscripts. So there is a, that that that's project. Uh, I will um uh, I will look for it now, and I will uh, put it um, paste it on, on the chat. And there are different projects that so they are working on it. But I guess uh, um, the the way uh, for now. So uh, for now is uh, uh, using the two ontologies model that we just mentioned la um, on Wednesday, which are um, CDOC CRM and FRBR together, so that they are taking a few uh, classes from one model and a few classes from another model and try and uh, they were and they try to I mean those those other projects and they. Um, put it together in the ad hoc in their own project, but the, I, I, I actually and, and this this was uh, something that we were discussing with with Alberto, uh, Peter Storks and uh, and Franz that that we need probably an ontology for describing manuscripts, and that that's uh, that's something that you know could try to uh, put together all this information and have a model that can be used and that can be shared between, I mean, among um, scholars. So, yeah, this is, uh, this is but in terms of um, um, digital editions using uh, manuscript description with uh, um, semantic web, I don't have any, um, um, no, I, I, I cannot think about anything. I, I don't know if other people uh, know some projects. Yes, could I, com are... Sorry, could I comment on that? Sorry to. Yeah. Um, oh, cool. There is a project at the University of Oxford led by Toby Burroughs, linked open data project of manuscripts of the Phillips collections from four um, archives. Um, I forget the name of the project. Um, but it's uh, the manuscripts and catalogues of a Phillips collection. Toby Burrows, B U R R O W S, University yep. of Oxford. To Toby's also the lead of the manuscript migrating, mapping migrating. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. So it, it's it's yeah. in the chat. I posted yes. the link um, in the yeah. chat. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. That's, that's what I was. Uh, I, I know about that project. It's based on provenance data. Um, yeah. I would be just to follow. I would like. I would be quite interested in following up with you directly on this work, actually, because I'm working on a union manuscript catalog, and uh, so I'm I'm interested in the more comprehensive um, transformation into linked data, rather than just the provenance. But if we could potentially follow up, I would be quite interested in your research on that. And, yeah, um, I mean, at the moment, I but um, I'm working on this particular project, which is the that the, uh, a catalog of translate um, manuscript translation uh, in the Middle Ages, and is led by uh, Antonio Montefusco, uh, which is uh, the, the 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 expert of the the, the this specific domain, and uh, and I w I was trying to uh, to. 
uh, define a, um, the, the, a model for, for the manuscript description because there is, I mean, they are focusing on, uh, on the description of ma on the materiality and linguistics, try to, to, to map it out. Uh, so that's, that's but it, it, yeah, again, it, it, they are all catalogs, but obviously you can link a digital edition. I mean, I, we can link uh, the transcription of a particular manuscript. Okay, here's a request from Maya. I want to thank you all for a very interesting. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I, I see that in a. Ah, so, I mean, we are always happy to be invited, Maya. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, it's always a question of timing. <laughs> so, would be great to come to Georgia. Absolutely. It's just a question of, of timing. So, thank you very much for thinking of, of us. So, of course, we can create a delegation, the Marco Polo delegation to Georgia, and uh, we are happy to pay you a visit, if possible. We can't hear you. you. Your microphone is on mute. My daughter has a winery in San Agrelo and... Uh, Sounds <laughs> good. <laughs> we can join these two things together. Okay, then we come all, all together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Really, and uh, in online format also, if uh, it will, before the... Uh, if oh, they, uh, only in presence. Flight, <laughs> only in face-to-face. -face. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you very much, very much for everything. Thank you. Here's a question from Sarah Iris. How much time should you add to a project for coding? A very good question. I guess uh, this is a little bit like asking how long is a piece of string. Exactly, that's the answer. So that really depends on both things. So the amount of material and the depth of your encoding. So if you want to encode, each uh, ratio of each letter so because this is super uh, relevant uh, for your paleographic research then it will eat up all your lifetime and if you have uh, 200 documents of uh, a length of 80 folia uh, then you won't be able to finish your work in in a lifetime not even as a team so that really depends uh, you always have to do some practical uh, um, um, uh, tests for this and uh, depending on your project if you have a team of collaborators you can all, you can share several tasks and uh, that makes all the difference then so if you work alone uh, of course you can't only take care of encoding so your time is restricted for the coding process but it's the very basic you can't start from the end so and what you, your editorial decision, what to encode and what not to encode for, for economic reasons uh, can't be returned. So, of course, you can always go back and enrich your data again and uh, take care of phenomena that you realize, ah, they are, uh, they are relevant, but uh, I, I didn't encode them or I started to encode them, but then, 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 uh, uh, then, then skip them again, or I only learned at a later stage, this is uh, super interesting and I want to encode this, and while you continue encoding, you encode that, but your data becomes inconsistent, and that's the, the, the greatest flaw you can produce in your data. So your data should be always consistent, so from the beginning to the end. So and these editorial decisions are very, very important. So before you start uh, to have a clear idea, so what is necessary essential what is feasible with the resources at hand and what is uh, so also required by your community for example i mean you can't do a diplomatic transcript and ignore um, features that the community wants when when uh, the community looks at your your edition so there are many many decisions and uh, it's not just to follow I mean, just to follow a traditional paradigm of how to edit, make an edition of your text, where you can rely on routines that have been established in the course of, of decades. 
in the digital, everything is still open. I mean, we have seen the, the whole field of linked open data. If you want to go into this direction, you get easily uh, drowned by, by the possibilities and the lack of support and tools that make sure that after two years, there is your product. So that's a general feature of uh, editorial, digital editorial projects that your focus will always be on the focus which is fine in the digital humanities community, but which is always uh, uh, a deficiency and a shortcoming for traditional scholars uh, and the, the disciplines uh, if you're not able to present your product in the end. And it's not very satisfying maybe for you either, so you really have to be aware of, of this. May I ask a question? Please. Please, could you could you comment on the on the question of sustainability and how and where to make available data sets? Uh -huh. Because visualization, with the advance of technology, everything may become um, obsolete if we don't share the data sets. Thank you. Absolutely, one 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 answer you gave already yourself. So the focus should be on your data because that's what will survive. Presentations will break, so that's for sure. But uh, I'm not uh, in charge for giving uh, an answer for everything. So who is in our team who wants to comment on that? Okay, I can tell you something about oh, yeah. the geography and the load. Um, usually you are going from two different point of views in the sense that when you are going to build your own product uh, usually this means that you have very specific purposes uh, and modelings in mind and uh, this means that often this is not uh, uh, really one-to-one -one relationship between your models which are much more specific and detailed and what you can find in a typical law of the vocabulary ontology, which is such much more generic usually because it's built to be applied to several different projects. So uh, the typical flow here is that you first uh, try to look at the other ontologies to get an idea about what is usually modeled inside the characteristics, the features of the object we're trying to describe, but then you create your own model, maybe of course compliant with all of what exists, enrich it as you want, and then you have some presentation, in this case towards the load cloud, which just selects a subset of data from your own mo models and database and uh, provides them in the load format. So in this case, you may be luck and find someone who has already encoded the taxonomies for a typical inscription, but you may also want to add more and so integrate this vocabulary or maybe you just don't find anything. You are providing your own triples and your own vocabulary together. There's a question to you, Tiziana, by Valentina. <laughs> so. We can't hear you. Okay. Oh, I can't hear you. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I just wanna wanna add a, a few things about about sustainability. And in case uh, I, I also ask Daniele if he wants to add uh, something, because sustainability uh, is obviously a data set, but it's also uh, I mean um, I I also think that um, in uh, within this term we can we can uh, add a few um, a few best practices uh, that we can uh, we can use i mean especially for for those who are doing a phd and they're doing a, um, a digital scholarly edition etc i mean i um, i mean infrastructures and with infrastructure there are different meaning of infrastructure but infrastructure are really important because uh, it's not only uh, publishing the, the your data set but it's also you know um having the, the possibility of uh, con keep um, publishing it and and the, the infrastructure it, it is really important i mean uh, the uh, dh center is also an important uh, an important uh, um, um, 
subject to, to, to talk to. I mean, uh, if, you, if you want to work on a digital scholarly edition, you don't have to have your digital scholarly edition on your laptop. I mean, this is, it can be really stupid, but sometimes um, it can be very, you know, like a simple uh, thing to, to say, but it's actually some, sometimes you, you find uh, people uh, that, that, that they're working on a digital scholarly edition or a digital scholarly project and that they have their own project on their computer. So you need to have certain things setting up and uh, uh, the, the security of, um, that, that your data won't be deleted for any, I mean, for anything. I mean, this is this is really important. And uh, the infrastructure, a server that someone takes care or of the of, of that server, so um, anything is uh, that that can be, yeah, um, that can ensure that your project is gonna be is gonna be that is really important, and it's also. Um, yeah, and that does a, I mean, um, real uh, creating a digital scholarly edition is not just getting some TI, getting some, you know, or load and uh, transforming HTML. It is a bit, is a bit more complex, and or in this complexity, we need to 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 take care of data, and this is really important. I mean, if Daniela wants to say something else about infrastructures. Because it's not only, I mean, uh, just transforming it. it. We can, you can have a database to uh, to, to uh, manage your data. You can, you or you can, you can have different infrastructure, software infrastructure, but also uh, hardware infrastructure. And this is something that we usually don't say, but we have to. Uh, we we need to take care because we we are kind of losing and there and there is a lack of memory of many projects that we uh, we we have seen during this this la uh, last 20 years uh, or actually 30 or uh, 40 years and we are we are basically you know like we we we're just losing lots of me of memories and yeah memories or um, yeah, uh, part of our uh, of our knowledge. Could I reply, uh, Tiziana? May I reply? Please. Um, uh, we uh, I worked on a on a project that's quite old, a fifteenth century um, Spanish poetry from Cancioneros at the University of Liverpool, and we have a big data set, but the interface now is obsolete. So we are putting the the data set into the university digital repository. So this will, uh, uh, many people are doing this now, not only for sustainability, but for reuse. There are increasingly projects that want to take a data set under a Creative Commons license and creating bigger data. Um, so making it available through a university digital repository, for example, as part of your um, editorial project is an important thought uh, for posterity thank you absolutely i totally agree and and also for i mean we really need to take care of all the the, the works that, that, that the phd student have been doing i mean the, the lots of time and research that that lots of people have been doing the last 30 years they've just lost Yes, a, 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 a digital repository, for example, universities, where it can be uh, the conservation, but also reuse, uh, which is important as well, so that we're not reinventing the wheel every time, but creating more data or modifying the data under a Creative Commons license. Thank you. And that's 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 a good solution for for the data, of course. Presentations, many, a lot of data doesn't uh, serve anybody if it's not presented with all the functionalities uh, for do analysis of these materials. So that's that's an unsolved problem, of course, because there is no there are no institutions who are able and have the capacities to to maintain uh, scholarly editions, which are always living resources. So yeah, that's, that's that, a huge uh, yeah. But sustainability is also a matter of uh, designing and thinking in a different way. That is, uh, we now live in a sort of a uh, flux where you can't 
no more think that uh, and once you have published something it is there on paper and stays there from, uh, forever we are just going to produce pro to provide products which are digital products and this means they are going to constantly be enriched and transformed by all the participants and uh, this means that uh, we must, first of all, uh, make sure that uh, our presentation is completely separate from our content, because our content is the part which has the longest life in terms uh, of uh, sustainability. So you may well have some data which are still perfectly usable, but you don't have any more technologies or user interfaces which are fit to this new world. So uh, this implies that uh, we have first uh, strive to model data in a way that uh, it's useful to be reused and transformed in the future. And then as a part of our work is also the technological refactoring. That is, we have to migrate legacy technologies and legacy content into new ones and maybe enrich them in this process. So, uh, in a sense, rem tene verba sequentur, that is, the presentation is just the consequence, the final product of something which is much more durable and much more complex to be thought in isolation. Just a quick... Prego, prego, prego. Prego, prego. Faccio... Volevo chiedere un'ultima domanda. Un'ultima domanda. Uh, per la didattica andiamo verso le plurieccellenze per ambiti, cioè eh, dal trasformazionale al trasform al, alla modifica trasformazionale da codice a codice, da hardware a software, da eh, visualizzazioni, immagini, codici, eh, sempre più complesse. Per cui a livello didattico, didattico chiediamo a queste smart communication eh, una pluralità di eccellenze, non più competenze. Perché io eh, non avete, scusatemi, scusatemi, eh, io ho calcolato anche l'ambito scientifico-matematico eh, per dare una validazione scientifica ai nostri linguaggi di comunicazione noi dobbiamo avere delle val validazioni matematiche per cui oggi ci sono i linguisti matematici tipo Planet con cui sto lavorando io e faccio fatica, vi assicuro, faccio fatica io ho pluricompetenze a seguire Planet nella validazione scientifica del linguaggio umanistico della public communication cioè è difficilissimo cioè io per entrare in quest'ottica quindi la domanda non voglio essere lunga come potremo noi avere tutti queste plurieccellenze ecco io oggi ho acquisito da voi da voi eh, delle eccellenze meravigliose è chiaro, però faccio fatica a seguirvi non per la lingua ma per l'ambito delle codifiche perché io sono ho una triennale in informatica faccio fatica a seguire ma ci riesco ancora, ma questi ragazzi, a questi ragazzi, un'ultima domanda poi vi lascio, cosa chiediamo? Plurice eccellenze, trans competenze, trans eccellenze? Lo chiedo a voi che siete giovani, grazie, scusate. Non so, un commento su, su questo intervento. Oh, I'll tell you one thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, um, yes uh, uh, basically in, uh, in Italy there is a uh, uh, huge problem uh, about the basis uh, <laughs> of uh, the um, um, computer. Um, I have uh, experience in uh, teaching and uh, sometimes uh, um, I have problem with students uh, who are in difficulty to uh, transform a uh, file word in a PDF. So um, the, I think that it is important to uh, do not think uh, what many people think now, uh, that uh, students uh, who are born in uh, 2000 are <laughs> uh, basically um, yet be well, uh, well informed about uh, um, informatica and uh, computer because uh, it is not so and uh, um, about the DH uh, there is uh, also 
um, like we said in the first uh, lesson, um, a prejudice uh, from uh, many teachers. And uh, uh, so it is uh, difficult to, um, to um, arrive to the students if their teachers are not convinced about the the uh, utility and the necessity of these uh, disciplines. So uh, I would, <laughs> uh, I think that it is a important consideration to to do. Uh, so <laughs> thank you. If I may, okay. uh, it's a very broad question. I will give a very broad answer, but short. Um, in schools, high schools, for example. Uh, informatics, digital cultures are often taught by the uh, teacher of maths. There's this state of mind, this mentality for which this, the teacher of math is the other. In universities, in the faculty of humanities of Palermo, a number of professors from engineering with an engineer background teach them. Now they can teach me so much. They're so much better than me at engineering. But the point is that informatica humanistica or computing in the humanities is a matter of humanists and should be taught by humanists with a humanist approach. Yeah. Right? We have given this class without talking about numbers, talking about logic, but logic is philosophy, talking about um, markup languages, which are meta languages that describe another language. So if you if you set the teaching from humanities viewpoint, I think we can for we can train new generation of digital humanists in a broad sense. They can tackle this challenge of uh, making a new humanism with the new technologies it's um, like it happened with the invention of print in which we had uh, a new like aldous aldous manutius so a new generation of humans who uh, were familiar with the technology and could tackle that that challenge thank you absolutely Uh, Our accident. <laughs> if Can you are not talking, please put your microphone on, on mute. So, uh, uh, further questions. So, you have an answer Can to I... Valentina. Yeah, Valentina. Yeah? Tiziana, Can please I... go ahead. Yeah. yeah, in the in in the B flow project, I showed you that is not uh, it is not um, yet or published. As you can see, there's a, the, the link is my GitHub. It is not uh, published yet. So, um, but it will be in probably in a, in a few months, probably exactly September. Exactly the way it shouldn't be, right? What do you mean? On your computer. <laughs> the edition is on your know. computer. No, no, okay. No, it's not, it's not on my computer, obviously. <laughs> ah, okay. No, I, yeah, obviously, it's not on my computer. It's, um, I just uh, use GitHub uh, to show them how it should be. That's, that's how it is. Um, that's, that's only a way to, uh, to let them also um, fill it up. <laughs> and with content but it is obviously not not on my computer it, yeah there is obviously because i'm working on it but um what i was saying is that they are not including the at each entry it, what i'm doing is basically i'm uh, describing each entry with um the ontology and I, I just ex expose my uh, my data with an ontology, so it, it has a different. Um, I mean, the model uh, is based obviously also on the on the models that I found uh, that, that they are, the digital humanities is using, it. but um, it, um, they are not encoding in uh, with, with the, the the ontology is it, just. Uh, produced by the but by, by a script and but it also it can also be um i mean the the research that that, that uh, um, it can be also through the 
the uh, ontology. So you can have the the the, the, the you can uh, you can search something on the the the, the thing that I, I made it, but you can also use an endpoint and just search something if you know Sparkle, you know that the, the language that uh, it, it was uh, mentioned that they can query the uh, they can query RDF. And then you can you can also do um, your queries or, or your own queries if you know uh, the language the, the language, but but in general you don't really write um, ontologies by hand, and that's why that that's that's the main thing. I mean you can put the link on DBpedia, yes, of course. But in that case you don't really use a script, but uh, yeah. So, uh, it, and if you have a database that is already modeled, that is already modeled on the basis of the, your idea of uh, how it needs to be shaped, how your data needs to be shaped, then you can uh, you can also think, okay, but I actually in this moment I, I, just, I want to add a description of the data because in that case there's nothing i mean what what um fiona was saying uh that you don't if you don't have uh, um your the 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 description of your data you you can lose the infrastructure your, your database and that's it so that there's not obvious i mean obviously i'm doing you know it's very simple <laughs> it's not like that but yeah but you can you can lose a little uh, a bit more or i don't know what is for you what you mean with, with that with that category that you're using so it is really important in uh, humanities uh that, that that if that you describe data okay okay thank you it's so clear thank you I, I, I just want to say something, just to mention uh, the, the, the uh, Association of Digital Scholarly, uh, the Digital Humanities, uh, um, Italian Digital Humanities, the IUCD, Associazione Informatica Umanistica e Cultura Digitale, which I actually invite everyone to, to join the, 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 this organization, this, this association. Uh, because the, the, also we, we share lots of information on, on the mailing list. But um, uh, uh, there is a, um, every year a, a conference organized by the, the association. And uh, uh, two years ago in Udine, uh, the, the, there was um, uh, this, this scholar, um, Dino Buzzetti, which is a really important uh, um, uh, scholar in digital humanities. And he, um, he started this presentation saying, uh, who, um, how, do you, how, how can you translate? Can someone help me? Um, chi forma i formatori? Uh, who, yeah, we cannot hear you. Um, who's going to teach teachers? Yeah, teach who is going to teach teachers for the digital, human, the digital humanities? So I think this is a really important, I mean, uh, um, question that, that the, uh, Rita Maria raised. Uh, who is, I mean, what is the curricula that someone has to have to, in order to, to be a, a real digital humanity? Is there, is there a real digital humanities? Well, who is, I mean, because, because uh, you know, on, on one hand, we, we just have lots of people that now that they want to, uh, get the money for funding for the project and we, with the, the, the you know through the digital uh, but in the other hand on the other hand we we, we really need to also to have uh, skills because I also think that you know like uh, who I mean who is a digital humanities what kind of skills needs to have these digital humanities what kind of skills do I need to have? Uh, in order to uh, to you know to 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 plan and uh, realize my digital scholarly project, what kind of criteria? There are a few things. Yeah. 
I take the occasion to uh, announce once again our wonderful uh, new introduced Laurea Magistrale in Digital Humanities. So, I mean, we have study programs and they are all part of this empowerment, uh, if, you, if you will, of humanists who don't inter... Uh, act with uh, informatics or computer scientists in the way so here's my thing uh, i want that please help me so but so to enable so digital humanities are in between so doing this communication and translation of uh, of ideas and uh, and technology and i hope so i mean these study programs which are also at bologna for example so which is also uh, has been launched before the one here in Venice. Uh, these are, I think, uh, very good complements to the educational landscapes uh, in, in the field, the, the intersection of uh, informatics, technology, and uh, humanities. So, I mean, of course, there are various levels of, so I mean, there is some basic computer literacy, so which doesn't have to be, you don't have to be always a digital humanities expert to uh, work in your discipline and do good research with digital components, but you then have to rely on other experts, but some basic understanding is key, like mathematics, as uh, propedeutics, uh, and nobody says, uh, or, or I don't know, if you do even modern languages you need some latin so i mean it's just part of the uh, knowledge ecosystem and uh, um, some basic understanding is required today uh, to carry out digital uh, research in uh, humanities re research in uh, a digital environment that's uh, just a side remark yeah may please. i add a comment to this please please um i think what's actually key with digital humanities is that it's a whole shift of um, philosophy and uh, mentality because digital humanities is communal and it's aggregating and it's growing. It's growing out of the community and into the community. It's, a, it's very different to um, conventional uh, disciplines which are much more top-down and kind of master oriented in terms of someone knows for life and is teaching new students. So we need the newcomers, new ideas, new questions to research, to build that into digital humanities. And I'm finding that the IIIF community, for example, is a very good example of that, the way it operates and also um, the way it, it develops where even um, proprietary companies are contributing, they're open sourcing their developments and giving them back to the community. So I think that it's very important that we the centers for digital humanities and I want to comment on Fiona's question also on that I think digital humanities centers in universities or in libraries are actually uh, the point to for, I mean where to go rather than just the um, IT departments and the repositories because they may preserve the material but they don't really do anything with it and uh, so I just think this is important <laughs> Aspect. Could I could I add a comment? I absolutely agree that the library is already something of a digital hub, and it's the libraries, university libraries, that should be the focus for um, for the um, development of digital humanities. Um, in the UK universities, you tend to have some universities which have an elaborate digital humanities institute or centre, and others, m most others who have nothing. And going back to what a digital humanities teacher should be, I think pedagogy is the way forward as well. From, from ab initio, that, to quote Moretti, um, distant reading, students can read in different ways including distant reading which involves using digital humanities tools in order to engage with the humanities subjects and i think that is also a way forward a bottom up not just a top down silo approach which is what you get with funding bodies and and digital humanities institutions only thank you May I? Uh, this discussion is extremely stimulating. It is making me think of very broad topics, which is digital humanities constantly forces us to break the barriers. 
um, an aspect that has just come out is the collaboration between libraries and the academic staff. But, uh, and that's and the main obstacle, at least in Italy or in southern Italy to this, is mostly this, the mindset. Um, and that's a key one key thing. Okay, you understood what I meant. The second thing is another barrier that I had to break in my life because I've uh, been doing different things, including teaching high school and even middle school. I think we really need to engage as academics um, as a uh, academic people. It's a um, You're on mute, uh, Paolo. You switch to. That's better because I was saying something stupid. No, uh, no. The thing is, uh, I think we should really engage with that low-level matter, which is high school teaching. We should really take a leading role in uh, demanding that a general digital culture education is provided at school, not only in terms of math and calculations, but in terms of digital cultures, privacy. Uh, Etc. And also, yeah, the the DH way. Yeah, and even there, uh, the question who is teaching the teachers is very important because what I see also in Germany is uh, very often a very naive approach. So to distribute uh, some uh, um, tablets to to a classroom and then it's uh, digital. So uh, we arrived in the digital teaching area. So which is very uh, very stupid thing to to think. But of course, I mean th that's where we as uh, specialists in the field should really uh, also have a voice uh, and make better suggestions. Uh, Tiziana, is this a... Uh... Yeah, I just <laughs> want to say that um, um, I also think that the, the, the digital humanities is a really interdisciplinary field. And I don't think that um, we don't have to get, get connection with computer science. Because because uh, sometimes I really hear um, things that because um, so, some humanists they learn uh, DIY uh, you know in the, the, they learn themselves uh, they the, the self thought they the, the um, programming languages and sometimes they they just don't have uh, a clear idea so I mean sometimes obviously it's not it's not always the, the, the case but um, and they also I really think there is the, the, the interdisciplinary uh, the interdisciplinarity is really important we need to collaborate with computer scientists I mean yeah. this is this is something that yeah um, so is someone talking is anyone? yeah uh, I can I say something? Federico, can I say something? Yeah, please go ahead. Federico Boschetti is hidden behind the VDPH yeah, logo. I yeah. totally agree with. Uh, yeah, thank you, thank you. I totally agree with uh, Tiziana, and uh, I guess uh, that uh, uh, we need uh, to have uh, heavy, to have a strong uh, research questions, and these research questions must be uh, both uh, in uh, the field of the humanities, okay, and in the field of uh, computer science. Otherwise, uh, 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 we have a big risk that is uh, to teach uh, to the teachers uh, uh, only the uh, technical aspects. On the contrary, we need to afford the scientific aspects. So, naturally, we must have some abilities to encode, for example, but it must be clear why we are encoding, which are the questions that we have uh, in the humanistic field for our uh, background okay and uh, uh, when uh, when uh, uh, the computer scientists uh, that work on the digital humanities uh, um, they, they 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 must have uh, other questions that are uh, that are uh, uh, questions uh, in uh, computer science. So, for example, how uh, the textuality, okay, can be modeled 
for example, no? So we, we, which are the models, uh, um, which are uh, the algorithms uh, uh, that uh, uh, they can improve, that they, that they can create, uh, okay? Because uh, uh, we have uh, new questions and these questions must be shared in this interdisciplinary uh, playground in a certain sense no so not just a technical uh, point of view uh, technical point of view is naturally very very important summer schools are extremely important to uh, share these how to no modality but uh, we need to know the why and what of the digital humanities Thank you very much. So this discussion turned into a very fundamental uh, discussion. Uh, so you, you missed the chance to ask very small and practical questions, but that's um, that's the easy thing. So you can always contact us uh, if you need references, uh, tools or uh, reference books, uh, lists of further information uh, for a specific thing you have in mind. So please don't hesitate, uh, write to our VDPH address and we will uh, then um, share it with the colleague here uh, of our team who uh, then give you some feedback, some some uh, hints for uh, further information. So that's uh, absolutely welcome. Uh, we reached the end of uh, our slot. Uh, slot uh, and um, yeah, there will be another short discussion, uh, I, I think, after the keynote uh, this afternoon. I would like to thank everyone uh, very much for this uh, intense and uh, very experimental and also very interesting uh, strand. So, uh, of course, to the organizers, to my team, to Paolo, Tiziana, Daniele, Federico, Angelo, uh, Alberto, Linda, who is not present right now, oh, she is there. So Linda, so who worked all the time in the background, and I mean, she had the most, the most contact with uh, our dear participants. So indispensable to to make this uh, really function and happen. So thank you very much to the team. I hope I didn't miss anyone because we are so many. Uh, uh, no. Okay, and thank you very much to to uh, the participants. I mean, it's. Uh, 